Yeah, okay, like usual. I'll get moving in a few minutes. You know, I'll wait for kind of everybody to stream in. But if you got any questions now while I'm just kind of sitting around here, feel free to shoot. I like how the zoom era is getting progressively more oppressive as the weather gets better again. It's sunny, it's nice outside. I like I should be on campus. It's like my office looks out onto the quad and so I'm like, oh, that'd be really nice. But no, instead I'm in my, my little office where I have to keep the shades down so I can still see my monitors. One second. hot water heater in my house is busted and I was waiting for them to call and come. So naturally the hot water heater, the plumber is going to schedule to come exactly in the middle of teaching this class. So hopefully I won't have to get up and do anything. That's how these things work. It's like we have a window here. It's going to target exactly where you're otherwise occupied. At least they show up unlike say the cable person. Okay, let's see, right about 24, 25, slowly ticking up, get moving here in a minute. Uh, like I said a minute ago, and there are only like six or seven people, and if you got any questions now, I'll reserve the next minute or so to um, hit anything you pitch at me, otherwise I will get moving in 45 seconds to a minute. Also note, it's been nice, pretty good activity on Slack channel. We get a fair number of emails. So I'd like to see that. Um, if folks are struggling with anything, please don't continue struggling. Just sort of hit stuff in the Slack channel. We'll get to it when we can. Um, you know, I usually hit the sack pretty early, so I don't always get things after like nine or ten. But you know, I typically am at my computer because uh, there's nowhere else to be nowadays. So I will answer your questions. Okay, 332. I'll go ahead and get moving here. So um, today is, as I sort of mentioned, I think earlier on in the term, um, this is the first week where we start to delve back into nuts and bolts. We've actually been talking about fairly abstract, high level stuff. I wanted to sort of dazzle you with the power of uh, sort of tidyverse things like dplyr and ggplot and, and show you our markdown. Um, but I actually was brushing over much of the nuts and bolts R stuff that other R classes might actually have you do first, sometimes for almost the entire term or something. Um, so if we want to get further in using stuff in R and doing general actual programming with it, we have to learn these nuts and bolts things. You've been using a lot of these things already, possibly without noticing it. So we'll get into it. Okay, so <clears throat> right up to this point, um, we've been playing around with data frames. We've been using them to make plots, to summarize data, to do joins, things like that. <clears throat> That's some powerful stuff that can get you pretty far. If you're working with relatively simple data sets and simple applications, you've honestly learned enough tools to get by with that sort of thing, right? If you have really clean, nice, easy to work with data already, you've learned just about everything you really need to know to do really basic stuff. 
Okay. Um, but for most people in social sciences, you're going to be working with uh, harder data than that. You're going to be getting things either that are in difficult to deal with formats, things like multiple linked surveys with a mix of wide and long data, or you're going to get administrative data, which has always its own unique things wrong with it. There is no administrative data set that is actually, I don't know, good. They just sometimes are hiding how bad they are. And so we're probably going to be dealing with things where we need to come up with more sort of bespoke solutions to our problems. To do that, we're going to need to get more into the weeds of programming. To do that, we first need to talk about different types of data in R, because not everything is a data frame. Okay, so up till now, we have been focusing a lot on data frames. Data frames are actually lists of vectors. Lists and vectors are two other types of data in uh, R. We've been using vectors too, but we've sort of steered away from lists by and large. We'll get into them today. Okay? So in a data frame, a data frame is a list. Each one of its columns is a vector, and all the vectors in the data frame have to be the same length, which is the number of rows in a data frame. Data frames look like they are a square or rectangular matrix, but they're actually lying to you. They are instead a list. And we're going to see the implications of that a little bit later. Okay? Because these are not the only objects we want to work with, we are going to need to learn how to work with things like lists and matrices and vectors. For instance, if you want to get stuff out of linear regression output, you're going to need to know how to work with lists. So what we're going to cover today are, in order, we're going to talk about dealing with vectors, which some of this is review from day one. We're going to talk about matrices, and then we're going to talk about lists. And all this is sort of to get us at doing things we can't necessarily or can't at all do with uh, things like dplyr or functions, sort of general tidyverse uh, tools. Okay. okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about vectors. So if you remember, we generally call any set of values where all the values are the same type in R a vector. We created vectors uh, multiple times over the course of the past lectures and uh, labs. We created them using the C function. C here stands for combine. Uh, sometimes people say it stands for concatenate. So the same thing. Concatenate just means to take a bunch of things and put them together into one thing. Okay? So if I say here, C137 negative 0.5, it's going to produce a numeric vector whose values are the things we told it, 137 negative 0.5. This is how you create a vector manually, a, ma a uh, numeric vector specifically. Okay, vectors are a one dimensional object. They only have one dimension, they have a length. Their length is the number of elements in the vector. If I take this vector up here and I say, give me the length of this vector, it's going to say four. It has four elements in it. It is a length four numeric vector. Okay? That is the only dimension they have. So vectors in R can only contain a single type of data in them. That is, we say things like it's a numeric vector, or it's a character vector, or it's a logical vector. That says every one of those elements is that one data type. A single vector in R cannot contain both numeric and character data. If you put numbers and character data together into a vector, it's going to turn the entire thing into character data. Because you can't store letters the same way you can store numbers, but you can store a number the same way you store letters. So R sort of goes to the least complex data type it can to store things. It turns out the most complex data type is character, which can store literally anything imaginable. So if you put some text in something, it's going to convert it to character. The whole thing, even if there's only one element of it that's character, the whole thing's going to end up character. Okay? Vectors can only be one type of data. We might contrast this to something like a data frame where every individual column out of a data frame can be a different type of data. Okay. So <clears throat> if you work with vectors and you perform arithmetic operations on them, if you do a little bit of math with them, R handles these things element-wise. This is different than some programming languages that aren't sort of vector-oriented. If I say take the vector one, two, three, and add it to the vector four, five, and six, 
The result is going to be 5, 7, 9. The result is actually 1 plus 4 is 5, 2 plus 5 is 7, 3 plus 6 is 9. You can kind of imagine the way R does math like this is if you lined up this vector and this vector on top of each other and you did the addition like straight down or you put them next to each other and did it across. It does them element by element, which means this statement here is synonymous to this statement over here. It's element by element. It doesn't do matrix or linear algebra on these things by default, say if we do multiplication, it does things element by element. Here's another example. If I take the vector 1, 2, 3, 4, and I say exponentiate it to the third power, this says cube this thing, it's going to do it individually on each element. 1 to the third, 2 to the third, 3 to the third, 4 to the third, okay? There's a lot of common mathematical operations you can do on vectors in R. You can do multiplication, you can do division, you can exponentiate things, you can take the natural logarithm of things. These are all sort of functions and different operations you can do on them, and they do it on each element individually. It sort of iterates over each of them automatically. Okay? You don't have to do it to each element individually, you can do it across an arbitrarily long vector. If I wanted to exponentiate a vector that had a length of 10 million. So I want to get the exponential function of 10 million different numbers. I could give that vector to this function. It would just do it across 10 million of them. R was happy to go across as many things as you give it in a vector. This is different from some other languages that can only do one number at a time. Okay. So a thing about R is you can do mathematical operations element-wise on vectors that are not the same length as each other. If you do this, what R will do is it will recycle the shorter vector to be the same length as the longer one. So for instance, if I say, to give me the vector 0 0.5 and 3 and multiply it by the vector 1, 2, 3, 4, what it's going to do is it's going to say 0 0.5 times 1 is 0 0.5. 3 times 2 is 6, and it's going to repeat this one. 0 0.5 times 3 is 1.5, and 3 times 4 is 12. Because this thing over here is half the size of this one, it basically just repeats this one twice and then does the operation on the two equally length vectors. That means this statement here is identical to this statement over here. Okay? or shown another way, it's the same as this. What R does is it repeats the shorter one to be the same length as the longer one so that it can do element-wise math. This is a particularly unusual thing R does, but it can be very useful and powerful. And you probably end up doing it all the time without thinking about it, just not normally with length two vectors. Okay, so here's a question. What if the shorter vector isn't a factor of the larger? Example, length three and four. I'm going to show you that in two slides. It does something weird and probably not what you'd expect, but I'm going to show you in a second. Excellent question when you anticipate my slides by a couple. <clears throat> okay, so before I show you that, I'm going to show you a special case that you've probably used before if you spend any time with R. A special case of vector recycling occurs when you use a scalar, that is a single number, in math with a vector. Okay? In R, a scalar, which is just a fancy math word for a single number, a scalar is actually just a length one vector. R does not treat the number three any differently than a vector of any other kind. It just has a length of one, which means if I take three and multiply it by a length four vector, what R is actually going to do is repeat threes until it is length four and then do element wise multiplication. Okay? So you could imagine this three over here is actually the number three four times, three, 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 three. So what R does is it takes negative one times three, then zero times three, one times three, two times three, and then it does the same with the addition it makes this a length four vector of ones and does element wise math with them. <clears throat> R obeys basic order of operations. So if I say 
three times this vector plus one, it will do the multiplication first, and then it will do the addition at the end. So multiplication always comes first. If I put one plus this vector times three, it would still do the multiplication first. It's not doing them in the order it sees them, it's doing them in the proper mathematical order. If you want to be able to control the order those operations happen in, like you want to do the addition before the multiplication, you could have wrapped this in some parentheses. It will obey the parentheses, executing things inside of parentheses before it does anything with the result. So that question, the thing that anticipated this slide uh, in chat here, recycling still happens if you have things with incommensurate lengths. An incommensurate length just means the smaller thing, uh, or sorry, the larger thing is not an even multiple of the smaller thing. So imagine we have a length four vector and a length three vector, and we produce some operation with them. Interestingly enough, R will let this happen. It will just give you a warning at the same time as producing a result because it thinks you probably didn't want to do that, but it's going to let you do it if you intended to. So this recycling behavior is a little strange. I take 1, 2, 3, 4, and I add it to 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5. What it's going to do is it's going to go 1 plus 0 0.5 is 1.5. 2 plus 1.5 is 3.5, 3 plus 2.5 is 5.5, and then 4 plus 0.5 is 4.5. It wrapped back around on the shorter one before the first one. So it recycled them in order. So you treated it like this vector was 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 0.5, .5, did its recycling and did that operation you probably don't want that to happen. And so R warns you, but in case you did want it, it allows you to do that. I can't think of many situations I've wanted to do this, but I have wanted to do it in the past when I was constructing some weird objects for different purposes, okay? So just know it can do that. And if you see a warning like this, you probably didn't want to do that. And you might want to check the lengths of your vectors are adding together. Usually it's something like you accidentally had one more element or one fewer element than you intended. Okay. So some operations in R will operate on an entire vector and return a single number rather than working on them element wise. We've used these in the summarize function in dplyr a whole bunch of times. Things like the mean, the standard deviation, the sum, the minimum, the maximum, the median. Okay, these are all things that take an entire vector and summarize it in some way. Here's an example. I could say, give me the sum of one, two, three, and four. The sum of one, two, three, four is 10. It runs across the entire vector, but it only produces one number as an output. Similarly, the maximum of one, two, three, four is just the number four. There's a lot of these different ones. They operate across the entire vector, but they're only going to return a single number. Any function that works this way, it takes in a whole bunch of numbers and returns one, or rather I should say it takes in a whole bunch of values and returns a single value, any of those can be used in the summarize function in dplyr. But only those things can be used in the summarize function in dplyr. Summarize expects always that it produces one result from a whole bunch of different values. So here's an example of applying uh, vector recycling to a problem. Um, let's say we've got maybe a whole bunch of test scores. And what we want to do is we want to put them on a standardized scale. We want to get Z scores for something. So the formula for getting Z scores is the Z score for observation I is equal to that given observation minus the mean of all the observations divided by the standard deviation of all the observations, okay? So programmatically, we could do something like this. <clears throat> Let's say I've got a vector x of test scores. It's just a whole bunch of integer values here. We'll call them percentage points. The formula to standardize these things to get the z scores would be to take the entire vector x of all the test scores, 
subtract from that vector. So subtract from each test score, the mean of all the test scores put together, do that operation first, and then divide the individual D mean scores by the standard deviation of all the scores. If you think about it, this right here is a length, what, 13 vector. This is a length one vector or a scalar. This is a length one vector, otherwise known as a scalar. So what R is doing is it's recycling this number 13 times to subtract it from that. And then it's recycling the standard deviation 13 times so it can divide that result. My result here is the standardized value of all of them. The thing to note here is the length of the result from all these operations is always going to be the longest element or the longest vector in the entire operation. This is length one, this is length one, this is length 13, which means the result will be length 13. That makes sense? Okay. You probably don't need to manually standardize something like that if you want to. You could use the scale function built into R, let's let you do other types of arbitrary scaling. I actually typically do it manually like that for a couple reasons. It's a, it's a simpler object and I like to have control over it. Sometimes I like to divide by two standard deviations. It's like Andrew Gelman's preferred way to standardize things going into regression models. Gets lets you compare them to binary variables. Um, anyway, you could do something like that. Okay. Any questions on uh, recycling, vector recycling like that? Does that make sense? Nothing? Okay. Uh, uh, Chuck, can you please show how the scale function works? Like, I'm not able to understand yeah. why, how the scale will work here. Yeah, sure. Oh, here, let me uh, make this readable to a normal human being. Uh, let's see, appearance, uh, let's see, 175. Okay. Okay. So the scale function, <clears throat> you do question mark scale here. Scale does scaling and centering of matrix-like objects. A vector in R is also a matrix-like object, so you can do it on an individual vector. So this says it's a generic function whose default method centers and or scales the columns of a numeric matrix. So you can say scale x, x being any numeric matrix or matrix-like object, which includes a vector. By default, it's going to center it and scale it, scaling being to uh, <clears throat> standardize it according to its standard deviation. Okay. So if I wanted to use this function, I can say something like, uh, Let's take the numbers one through 10 and scale them. If I say scale one to 10, the result of it is going to be the standardized uh, sort of Z score of that particular value. If you standardize the numbers one through 10, you're gonna end up with something symmetrical. So it's a positive and negative version of it sort of orbiting around the center of it near zero. Um, get it something like that. I can see that the exact same result of this would be yielded by going one to 10 divided by or minus the mean of one to 10 divided by the SD of one to 10. I would get the same numbers, negative 1.486, negative 1.486 to positive 1.486. Scale is literally doing the exact same thing as the formula for standardization of a variable, but it's also returning a couple other things. It also tells you what is the mean of the original data before scaling it, and what is the standard deviation of it before scaling it, which means if you use the scale function, you can actually unstandardize the result afterward because you can recover its mean and standard deviation. <clears throat> That's all it does. <clears throat> So it's different from that, uh, uh, like for uh, ggplot, we were also using something for uh, uh, yeah, so scale, scale manual. Yeah, something. so scale function here, the scale function is has nothing to do with things like scale, for instance, in ggplot, like scale alpha, scale underscore alpha. They use the same word scale, but they have no relationship to each other. Scale alpha talks about like how, how does your mapped variables get converted into how things appear on a plot. Scale here, the base R function, is about rescaling numeric variables into another variable scale. 
they're related in sort of the abstract way in that you're telling how to convert some sort of numeric information into a different sort of class of numeric information, but that's a really abstract way of thinking about it. Okay, okay. thanks. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So let's talk about types of vectors. So I've shown you a bunch of stuff you can do with numeric vectors. You can mess around with them in math and things like that. Isn't there another slide in the middle there? Okay, interesting. So other types of uh, vectors you can have, there are other types of the numeric vectors. If you wanna know the type of vector you're currently looking at in an object, and that could include say the column of a data frame, you can use the functions class, type of, or structure. There should be parentheses here. There's nothing special about type of, or structure. And these will tell you the kind of vector that you have. There's a few different common types of vectors y'all will probably encounter. These include numeric vectors we've been working with. Numeric vectors just contain numeric data that can have decimal points in them. So this, for instance, is a numeric vector I made of the number one, the number 30, four, and negative 3.14. You'll notice something about numeric vectors and vectors, well, especially numeric vectors. Um, I could do some math in the middle of generating this vector and R doesn't care. R immediately does this math and then makes it an element in the vector. You can put calculations in there if you want. R will just do them as it constructs the vector. Okay? This is a numeric vector. It contains a number or multiple numbers. There's also certain special types of numeric vectors like integer vectors. Integer vectors are numeric vectors which contain only whole numbers. So if I do something like 0 colon 10, that will make an integer vector of the numbers 0 through 10, the whole numbers. <clears throat> Another type of vector we've dealt with uh, before is character vectors. Character vectors just store text. A character vector like this could store red, blue, yellow, blue. You'll notice that when you create a character vector, you normally would quote what you're putting into it. R looks at that quote and says, OK, I'm going to ignore whatever is inside these quotes. I'm going to accept it as is and just make it character data inside a vector. Once R sees the quotes, it doesn't attempt to do any sort of processing of whatever is in the quotes. It just accepts it as is, makes it character data. If I put numbers inside of quotes, R will say it's character data. Don't treat them like numbers. Don't do anything with it. Treat it like it's a bunch of letters or symbols or something. Okay. So if you use any kind of quoted stuff inside the vector creation function combined, you're going to end up with a character vector. Factors are sort of a unique data type. You might typically construct a factor using a character vector, but factors are in fact their own special data type. You create factors using factor typically on some other vector. Okay? So this would change this character vector I made up here into a factor vector. Factors are a little bit special, and we're going to talk about them some more. Another type of vector we've encountered are logical vectors. Logical vectors are the simplest data type that exists in R. They can contain only true, false, or missing values. They're binary. They're very simple vectors. We tend to construct them by doing things like logical tests of stuff, saying country equals equals Oman generates a logical vector back if you remember our uh, dplyr examples. Okay. Okay. So let's say we want to make some of these vector types. So if you want to generate numeric vectors, um, there's all sorts of shortcuts for generating convenient types of numeric vectors. Sometimes you're going to want to do stuff like this. A common type of numeric vector you might want is some sequence of numbers that begins at one value and ends at another value. We can generate sequences using the function seq for sequence. If I say, give me a sequence from negative three to six by values of 1.75, what it's gonna do is the first value it gives me is gonna be negative three, what I said to start at. Then it's going to keep adding 1.75 to that. So negative 3 plus 1.75 is negative 1.25. Negative 1.25 plus 1.75 is 0.5, and so on, until it reaches the highest number it can go where its increment would not take it above the end value. 
So it stops at 5.75 because if it counts at 1.75, the next value it could give you in that sequence would be above six. So it stops at 5.75. So you might generate a sequence of numbers from one value to another if all you care about is the spacing between the values. Another thing you might want to do is you might want to take a vector you already have, like negative 1, 0, and 1, and repeat it multiple times. I say here, let's repeat the vector negative 1, 0, and 1 three times. If I say that, I get negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, 1. It takes this vector and repeats it three times in a row. An alternate formulation of this would be to say, take that vector negative 1, 0, 1, but repeat each one of its values three times. This would give me negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, because it repeats this three times, then it repeats the 0 three times, then it repeats the 1 three times. Okay? These are ways to manually generate different sequences or repetitions of numeric values that you might want to use for some purpose. Okay. You'll come up with reasons to do this. Um, I don't have any sort of conjured out here. I end up doing these sorts of operations reasonably often to um, solve programming problems. Okay. Okay. Another special case, uh, things you might want to generate are maybe you want to generate numeric vectors where all the values are whole numbers. That is, you want to generate integer vectors for some purpose. Okay, We can produce a series or sequence of integer vectors using the colon operator. If I say, in this example, I'm just arbitrarily picking this, I say I'm going to make the object n be equal to 12. If I say go from 1 to n, you can read the colon operator as 2. If I go from 1 to n, n is 12, so it's going to count out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. The colon operator just creates an integer vector that starts at the first value and counts by whole numbers up to the end value. It can go either direction. I could say start at 12 and go to 4, and it will begin at 12 and count down to 4. Okay. Creating integer vectors like this, a common use of it is to subset data. Let's say that I wanted to get the, like, the, tw the uh, say, yeah, I want to get like the first through 12 elements of a vector. I could subset that vector, put in brackets 1 colon 12, and it will spit out the first 12 elements. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a convenient way to uh, quickly sort of grab things you want. One second, I believe my hot water here is here. Give me one second. So not only is my hot water heater coming right now, but the thing about my house is it's the only house on my block that is behind a whole bunch of trees. So I can guarantee anytime anyone's bringing something to my house, they will call me to find where my house is. I literally just leave the note, I'm the only address you can't see, and normally people will drop it off where I want. Anyway, so going on integer vectors some more. Um, yeah, we commonly use this colon operator. You've probably seen me use it a bunch of times, and you'll see me use it all the time. It's a nice handy shortcut, um, and integers are something we want to use all of the time. Okay. So if you want to specify an integer directly and say a number like 5 or 10 isn't just a numeric 5 or 10, but is very specifically an integer, R has this weird syntax for it. 
If I want to say the number nine is an integer, I would say nine L. And this will specify that it is in fact an integer. If I get the class of 9L, it says integer. The reason it's L is mildly arcane. It turns out that L here, people generally believe stands for long. Long specifies a 32-bit signed integer in programming terms. But even the people who currently maintain R are not sure why it's L. So this is sort of might be apocryphal. It's just L. You'll probably rarely have to do this. But if some reason you need to specify something as an integer, it's usually because some cranky function demands only integer input. You can use L to do it. OK. So character vectors. Character vectors are for storing data as text. These are the type of things that will come in, commonly come up if you deal with names or addresses, ID numbers, zip codes, stuff like that. Don't treat your zip codes as numeric data. They have leading zeros that mean something. If you get stuff like that, it's probably going to be character data. You could create a vector of character data just by putting the contents in quotes. So here I say the first names are going to be Andre, Beth, Carly, and Dan, arbitrary sort of first names. Um, assigned to this vector. If I say, what is the class of the first names vector? I get character data. It knows its character because I put the stuff in quotes. Right? So you can store numbers this way too. If you put a whole bunch of numbers in there and put quotes around them, it'll be happy to store it. But you won't be able to do any math on them unless you actually convert that vector to a numeric vector. Okay. Character data cannot be used to do numeric operations or almost any operations in R at all. You can't even really put them into statistical models. If you put a character data into a statistical model, it gets converted to a factor. Okay, Character data can't really do anything for you most of the time. <clears throat> yeah. So factors are categorical data that encode a usually modest number of levels. Um, usually for something like sex or gender, experimental group, geographic region, country, continent, something like that that you want to encode in some way. So if I take a character vector like MFFM, I run it through the factor function and I assign it to sex. These are the theoretical sexes of the names on the previous slide. If I get sex here, it says M, F, F, M with levels F and M. Contrast that to the output on the prior slide. The prior slide over here, oh, sorry, I don't actually show it. Contrast that to this. Silly Chuck, what are you doing? If I display Andre, Beth, Carly, and Dan, you'll see it says Andre, Beth, Carly, Dan, all in quotes. If I say, factor that, Notice the output here is unquoted Andre, Beth, Carly, and Dan, and then it specifies that they have levels. These look very similar, but they are actually quite different data types. These things here are not the actual data stored in the factor. These are labels on the underlying levels in this vector. We'll show you what this means here in a second. Okay. So, it has levels. You'll notice here that the number of levels is not equal to the length of the vector we give it, but is rather equal to the number of unique values the vector takes. So here we take the values of M, F, F, M, but there's only two levels. They are F and they are M, and the levels are assigned in alphabetical order. Okay. So character data can't usually go directly into a statistical model. In fact, it just can't. Factor data can go directly into a model. Factor data is a little different than character data in that it has an underlying numeric representation. Factor data has levels, and these levels have numeric values. If I say as.numeric on my sex vector here, it returns the numbers 2, 1, 1, and 2. The reason for that is if we look at the levels, f is level 1, m is level 2, thus, Two, one, one, two. Two, one, one, two. Factors are actually numeric under the hood. What they're doing is they're linking this underlying numeric representation to a label. 
Okay, this is an arcane thing and it makes factors confusing and difficult to work with. But the fact that it has an underlying numeric representation is quite useful because these underlying numbers here determine, for instance, the order those levels are shown in your legends and GG plots and the which one gets used as the default level if you run a regression with a factor variable. If you want a particular level of a variable, categorical variable, to be the reference level in a regression model, make it the first level of that factor. It will become the reference level. Okay, important things to know. Okay, another type of vector we'll work with a lot is logical vectors. Logical vectors only take true and false values, and we don't usually generate them directly. Usually logical vectors are created as the result of running some sort of logical test. If you remember, logical tests include things like saying, does X equal the number five? That either produces a true or a false depending on each value of X, or if there's missing values, NAs. We can make logical vectors by defining binary conditions to check for. So for instance, I could take my first name vector I created earlier and say, okay, what are the length in characters of each one of these names? I can say the number of characters in each of those first names, Andre was five characters. Was it Andre, Carly, Beth, and Dan or something like Carly? I don't remember which one is which. Let me look at them. Andre, Beth, Carly, Dan. Okay. Andre, Beth, Carly, and Dan have that many number of characters in their names. I could say for each one of these names, which ones are greater than or equal to four characters in length? This is going to produce a logical vector. Five is greater than or equal to four, so it produces a true. Four is greater than or equal to four, so it produces a true. Five, true. Three is not greater than or equal to four, so it produces a false. Every single logical statement you've used in dplyr's filter command is one of these. It's actually taking sets of true and falses, and it's choosing rows in your data for wherever the trues line up and dropping the ones where the falses line up. Okay. So you can do math with logical vectors too. The thing about logical vectors is that because we're working with computers, and this is the way computers work, Trues are the number one and falses are the number zero. They are binary values. If I say something like, again, my name lengths greater than or equal to four, this produces a true, 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 false. You can take the mean, the arithmetic mean of true, true, false, and I get 0 0.75. What is that? What does a 0 0.75 represent? Yeah. One, 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 and zero. Yeah, it's the proportion of names that are greater than or equal to four. So if you get the mean of a logical vector, because I only take values of ones and zeros, that is the proportion of trues in the vector. Okay. So if for some reason you want to know something like this, which in my experience in programming turns out to happen all the time. Like if you want to know what proportion of values in a column are missing values get the mean of is.na on that column, and that's the pr proportion of missing values in a column. Okay? So manipulating and working with logical vectors as if they're numeric lets you do some useful and kind of powerful things. We'll probably do lots of examples of these in labs at different times. You'll see me do them in lecture slides too. Okay? This is sort of a useful trick. Know that logicals can be treated as numeric. So any of the tools you can use to manipulate numerics, you can do with logicals. Okay. Okay. Other thing you might want to do is combine together logical conditions. Ah, so here's a question. So factory number starts at one, but true false starts at zero. Is there anything else that starts at zero? So Factors start at one. True, false, you shouldn't really say. It doesn't exactly start at zero. Um, so it's just binary. It only takes two values. The actual numeric values are arbitrary so long as there's two of them. It's either zero or one. Um, in R, R is unusual among programming languages in that things in R generally start at one. 
in almost every other programming language in existence, numbers are Cartesian and they begin at zero instead of one. R was made by statisticians and to them, numbers counting starts with the first element of something, indexes begin at one. Most languages start at zero. Okay. If you're coming from Python, this probably drives you nuts and causes you problems. If you're a computer scientist, it makes you hate R. If you were a normal person who's never programmed before, it was probably intuitive to you and you never had to think about it and beginning counting at zero is weird. Okay. So here's a question. How can you tell the vector you're working with is a factor and not character? You can use the class function. Class will tell you if it's a factor or character. The other way you can do is just look at the output. If you just display the vector, factors look a particular way and characters look a different way. If there's quotes around stuff, it ain't a factor. I would usually use class to test them. Uh, here's a question. Is there something like factor that converts character into a factor variable that if you, you know, I'm thinking about if you're making like dummy variables and you want them to be zero and one and not one and two, is there mm -hmm. a version of that that um, would only work if it's actually binary data? So you want, so you're saying you want to, um, so what exactly, do you want to make dummy variables or do you want to, so if you want to make dummy variables, um, if you just convert something to a factor and put it in the regression model, it's going to split it into dummies automatically okay. in the model. Yeah, there's also a nice package called dummies specifically for doing customized um, different ways of arranging your dummies. Um, typically, depending on the application I have, I either just let uh, R handle them or I use something like dummies or my own manual code more often um, to break up and manually construct dummies. Kind of depends what you want to do. Cool, thanks. Okay, so. Maybe we're interested in something like which names have an even number of letters. I'm going to create a new vector that is a logical vector telling me whether or not it has an even number of letters. The way to do this is an interesting operator you have never seen before. I'm going to ask if the name lengths modulo 2 equals equals 0. This funny percent percent with nothing in it is the modulo operator. This is a common programming operator, but one you've never encountered outside of here for most of you. What modulo does is it takes this thing over here, divides it by the thing on its other side, and instead of giving you the result, it gives you the remainder. So if you say take the number five modulo two, it returns a one, because if you divide five by two, the remainder is one. I'll show you an example. If I say five modulo modulo two, it gives me a one. If I say five modulo modulo 0.75, it gives me a 0.5 because 0.75 times four is 4.5 or times five, six, 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 six is five point. I worked my way up there iteratively. That's how optimization works. Um, so anyway, Modulo is sort of a useful operator because it lets you do something like what I just showed you. If I want to figure out if something is an even number, I can say divide that thing by two and see if it has no remainder. The only numbers divided by two with no remainder are even numbers. This is a direct manual way to check if a number is even. Okay. So if I say look at the even length ones, we get false, true, false, false, because this was a length five name, length four, five, and three. It worked. If you remember, this was uh, Andre, Beth, Carly, and Dan. Okay. So I might also want to know which one of these names has a second letter that's Dan or A. Dan is one of the ones with the second letter A. Dan is not a letter, to my knowledge, in the English alphabet anyway. So if it has a second letter A, I want a logical vector to indicate that. To do that, I'm going to do a slightly complex operation with a function you haven't seen before. I'm going to say, give me the substring of the first names, start at the second character, stop at the second character. This is going to extract the second letter of each one of the names and discard all the other letters. I then check to see whether it's the letter A. This is A bulky looking way, but probably the fastest way to check whether the second letter is A in each element of a vector. If we look here, we see that Andre's second letter is not A, Beth's second letter is not A, 
Carly's is, and so is Dan's. Okay, so this is just a quick way to check the first name, see if the second letter is A. This is the type of operation you yourself might do in certain cases to check for particular values of something in a character vector. We're going to spend way too much time on character vectors and string manipulation stuff in week seven or week eight. We'll get there. Okay, so we could combine these things together. So maybe what we're interested in is which names have both an even number of letters and a second letter that's A. You can combine logical vectors together by saying, is the even length, is the length even, and is the second letter A? Well, it turns out, no. False, 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 false. None of them have an even length and a second letter that's A because Carly is a length five name, Dan is a length three name. So here's a question in chat. Could we use the poll function instead? The poll function where? Uh, are you saying in this particular example? Okay, no. So poll is a unique function in dplyr. Poll is for taking um, a data frame and removing one of its columns as a vector. So you use poll to pull a column out of a data frame as a vector, but you can't pull an individual element out of each element of a vector using poll. Instead, we want something like substring here, if that makes sense. Poll is for working on data frames. Okay, so this is combining. Remember, this is a bunch of trues and falses. This is a bunch of trues and falses. When you use an and, an and returns a true only where the element, element by element, it is true in both locations. If it's false in either one of these, it will return a false. Okay, we could also instead use or. The or one says, return a true when it's true in this one or in this one, element by element. So if any element of this is true or any element of this is true or both, it will return a true. So this is asking, give me every name that has an even length or has a second letter, which is A. We get false because Andre is neither even in length nor has a second letter A, but Beth is even in length, even though it doesn't have a second letter A. Carly has a second letter A, even if it's not even in length, and Dan isn't even in length, but it has a second letter A. So, and and or are used for sort of stitching together logical conditions in different ways. They have a different rule to them, but you can stitch them together this way and get a single logical vector, okay? You can also invert logical vectors of any kind using the exclamation point, which programmers sometimes call bang. If you ever hear a programmer say bang, they mean the exclamation point. Exclamation point can also be read as not. We could say here, I would like the opposite of even length or second letter A. So what this says is, I want every name that neither has an even length nor has a second letter A, which is going to give me just Andre and false for all the rest of them. So you'll see the exclamation point turns every false to true and every true to false. Exclamation point is useful because sometimes you find it easier to think of ways to get trues, but you actually want falses, or you find it easier to get the falses, but you actually want the trues. Do it whatever is easiest and then flip the values with the exclamation point. Some just useful tools for logics. Okay. So let's talk about subsetting. Start putting these things together. We can subset vectors in a number of different ways. One way to subset a vector is to take the vector, for instance, the first names, and pass an index or vector, um, usually a vector of indices of entries you want to keep. So I say here, I want the first names, but I specifically want the first and fourth elements of the first names vector. Square brackets here are used for subsetting. You can use them to subset most objects in R. In this case, vectors only have one dimension, so you just give them a single vector of elements you want to keep. This says, give me the first name and the fourth name, which is Andre and Dan. Okay. You can also pass an index or vector of entries you want to drop from a vector, and it will give you all the other ones. I could say, give me all the first names, which are not the first or the fourth. 
elements. This gives me Beth and Carly because what it's done is it's subtracted the first and the fourth elements from this vector and given me what remains, which is the second and third element of first names. And so this is sort of manual subsetting with numeric values. Okay. You can also pass to a vector a logical vector as long as the logical vector is the same length as the vector you're subsetting, it will give you the values where a true exists and drop them where a false exists, <clears throat> element by element. So if I say, give me the first names, subset them to the ones that have an even length or a second letter that is A, that gives me Beth, Carly, and Dan, because these are all the ones with an even length or a second letter that's A. Remember, even length and second letter A, these are not things looking up this information in first names. These are logical vectors I created earlier based on that information. These are just trues and falses. I put those trues and falses in a subsetting operation. It gives me all the ones where a true lines up. It drops all the ones where a false lines up. In this case, it drops Andre. I could also say, Give me the first name's vector, where my sex vector, if you remember, this takes the values M, F, F, and M. I could say where the sex vector is not equal to F. Okay, this gives me Andre and Dan, because I coincidentally made my sex vector line up with the sort of sex typical uh, um, for these particular names, right? Okay. So you can subset with logicals. This is, of course, a logical statement taking the values uh, true, false, false, true. So it dropped the middle names, Beth and Carly. Those things make sense? At least a little bit. So there's a question. Could you put the exclamation point on even length since we don't have an odd length? Yeah, if you want to be odd length, put an exclamation point on even length and it would invert just even length. Yep, just inverts it. Okay, so some other nice logical subsetting functions. I've used percent in before. Ah, so here's a question. This is an excellent and important question. So to subset, you use brackets rather than percent parentheses. Yes, this is very important. Brackets here are actually an operator. They're a special type of function. They're an operator which takes as an argument, its first argument is the object here and its other arguments are the things inside the brackets. They look different from other functions, but brackets are a special subsetting function, okay? Parentheses are usually used on most functions as the place you put arguments in, just not in subsetting. You could technically use parentheses with subsetting, but you all do not wanna see that. So anyway, uh, yeah, but yeah, brackets are very important. Okay, here's a useful function I've used a couple times. Percent in is a way to avoid typing lots of logical ors. If I wanted to say, give me the first names which are equal to Andre or equal to Carly or equal to Dan, instead of typing that all out, I could say, give me the first names that are in the vector Andre, Carly, and Dan. This returns to me. True, because Andre is in this vector. False, because Beth is not. True, because Carly is. And true, because Dan is. Percent in is just a shortcut for lots of or statements in a row. We've used it to do things like select specific countries. It's just a shortcut for lots of ors. OK. Another useful one is which. Which takes the trues in a vector and converts them into the indices of the trues. That is the locations in the logical vector that have trues. So up here we see this first names percent in Andre gives me true, false, true, and true. If I put this statement in a which, it returns to me one, three, and four because the trues in this logical vector are found in the first element, the third element, and the fourth element. So sometimes what you want is not all the trues and falses. You just want to know where to find the trues. You can do which, and it will convert them to numeric indices. Maybe you want to use it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you never end up using it, but it's nice to know about which. Okay. So 
Important things to know about, in vectors, missing values are coded as NA on entries without any quotes. So if I create a vector like this, this is a vector with missing values, I assign to it 1, 2, NA, 4, 5, 6, NA. It's length 7 with two missing values. Okay. Notice here NA doesn't look like character data, and I don't have to put it in quotes. It's in fact the same color as numbers. This indicates that to R, this is NA is a very special type of value. It can be treated as numeric data. It's a missing value, but it's a numeric missing value. There's actually other types of NAs too, but by default, R just assigns the type of NA that's appropriate for the data type you're making. So you usually never got to worry about it. Okay. So the thing about NAs is even a single NA will poison the well for many types of calculations with vectors. If you do something like calculate the mean of vector missing, you're going to get an NA. The issue is you can't calculate the mean of something if it has missing values in it. There's no logical mean when there's missing information. You can't calculate it. You don't know what it is. It's not defined. So in many operations in R that work like this, you can specify that you want to remove the missing values before the calculation using the argument na.rm equals true. This says, take missing values, remove them. Na, rm means remove, okay? If I say, give me the mean of vector w missing, na.rm equals true, what it's gonna do is it's gonna delete all the nas and then calculate the mean with whatever is remaining. The mean of one, two, four, five, six is 3.6. This is one of those real important ones you're going to want to use because you're often going to be calculating statistics like this for only the non-missing values. R makes you do it manually, which in my opinion is a good thing to do. You don't want to calculate the mean of something and not realize 95% of your observations are missing. It's better to know there's missing values. <clears throat> okay. So a thing about missing values is they're missing. You can't test to see if a value is equal to missing because it's missing. If I say, is vector w missing equal to na, I get the 1960s Batman theme song. I get na's over here, right? Okay. The issue is you can't test equalities with a missing value because they're missing. There's nothing to test. Instead, if you want to know if you have missing values and where they are, you use a function is.na. If I say, is.na vector w missing? It will give me a false if the value is non-missing, and it will give me a true if it is missing. So is.na is a way to do this operation that actually works. It produces a logical vector that tells you where the missing values are. The thing about this is.na, we can do what the na.rm function in mean does manually using this. If I say take vector w missing, and subset it to only the values where is.na is false. So we're, in other words, we're taking is.na, finding a true for all the missing values, but then we flick all those trues to falses and all the falses to true and subset on this logical vector. The result is going to be vector w missing with all of its missing values removed. We then calculate the mean of that, we get 3.6. That is the complicated way of doing literally exactly what na.rm equals true does. This is what the na.rm equals true argument is in R. It subsets a vector to its non-missing values before it does the calculation. You don't need to do this manually because it's a built-in thing, but you could do it and it will always be the exact same result. Question here in chat, what was the logical way you mentioned to find the proportion of NAs? If you want to know the proportion of NAs, you could take the mean of, so you could say mean is dot NA vector W missing. That mean it's going to return is going to be the proportion of values which are missing in vector W missing. <clears throat> okay. So, like I said, when testing logical conditions, NA will produce an NA rather than a true or false. If I ask for what, what values of vector W missing are equal to five, I get false, false, missing value where there's an NA, 
false, true where there's a five, false and missing value, okay? So it doesn't work on these NAs. Thing is though, this is weird. Thing is in R, percent in can handle NAs. If I say vector W missing, what values are in five? You'll notice instead of returning an NA there, it returns a false. For whatever particular reason, percent in does the same thing as equals equals, except when it encounters an NA, it still performs the test whether the data are missing or not. This is an interesting thing, which allows you to use percent in to bypass problems with NAs if you really want to. Even weirder, it lets you find NAs this way. You can say vector W missing percent in a missing value, and it returns a true where it finds NAs and vector W missing, which means it also can be used like is.na. Why? I don't know. And as far as I can tell, no one else knows online why they set it up to do exactly this, but it's very useful. Okay? This allows you to bypass issues with missings and also test for missings. People generally consider it bad R style to use percent in this way, but it's a nice shortcut to know in certain cases. Okay. So other things. Sometimes you're going to do some kind of calculation in R and you're going to get values like positive and negative infinities or not a number from your calculations. So R is a language meant for statistical programming and statistics often involves things like infinities and not a numbers. It also handles imaginary numbers and complex numbers, okay? So if I do something like take the vector negative two to two by one and divide by zero, I'm gonna get a couple negative infinities, not a number and infinities over here because that's the result of dividing by zero. You get some weird stuff. I can check for these sorts of values using the functions is.finite or is.not a number. If I say, tell me if the result of this is finite across these, none of these are finite numbers. Negative and positive infinities and not a number, none of those are finite numbers. So it returns a false across all of them, okay? If I ask for is not a number on the same vector, you notice I get false, false, true, false, false. So not a number is not a number, but infinities are numbers, so they get a false. Infinities, positive or negative, are either infinitely large or infinitely small numbers, but they are indeed numbers, whereas not a number is not a number. Okay? So if you ever need to hunt for these sorts of things or mess with them or run checks, these are the functions you want to do that. Okay? Just nice to know about. I can't remember ever actually needing to do this, except in um, when I'm manually coding maximum likelihood routines or something, and I need to look for infinities or something for the ends of distributions. Quite rare case, though. <clears throat> okay. So, some other useful things you might want to know about. Like with data frames, you can use the functions head and tail to preview the start and end of vectors. Head and tail work on just about everything. So if I want to see the first six observations or elements of the letters vector, letters is a vector built into R. It's the 26 letter, lowercase letters of the English alphabet. If I say head letters, I get A through F. I could say head letters, give me the first 10 letters, I get A through J. I could say tail letters and it gives me the last six letters of the alphabet. So head and tail work the same way they work on data frames. But head and tail on data frames show you the first so many number of rows. On vectors, they just show the elements, okay? So another way you can index vectors is by their names. And this is something that also applies to data frames and other stuff. So let's say we have a vector, which I'm going to assign to it, the numbers one through 26. Vectors can have names the same way a data frame can have names in their columns. I can say assign to the names of a vector letters. Letters is just the capital version of those letters I showed on the previous slide. <clears throat> if I do head to look at the first six elements of a vector, we see its values are one, two, three, four, five, six, but up here is another line. This line is the names of the elements of the vector. <clears throat> this is kind of like column names in a data frame. The names are separate. They're not data in the object, but they are sort of metadata. They're the names of the individual elements. A cool thing with names is you can use them to subset things. 
If I say, give me a vector subset, specifically the elements R, S, T, U, D, I, and O, I'm going to get back the elements of that vector, which are named R, S, T, U, D, I, O, which are the numbers 18, 19, 20, 21, 4, 9, and 15. Okay, so what this did is it went into this vector where it has all these names, and then it went down it, it looked for the name R, and then returned the number that has the name R, which is 18, and then the same thing for all these other ones. It went and looked them up and returned those values. Names are hella cool. The reason names are cool is if I took this A vector and randomly shuffled it, so I shuffled it so they're no longer in alphabetical order, I would get the same result with the names because I'm not subsetting on numeric order. I'm subsetting on the names of the elements and the names of the elements are attached to those numbers. If you rearrange the vector, the names go with the elements. This is great for subsetting things like data frames and other objects when you might move columns around or move rows around. It doesn't matter because the names follow them around, but their numeric positions don't. So very often you'll find me subsetting using names instead of numeric positions because the names stick with stuff. Okay? You might experiment with this and see how it works. We'll do it a lot throughout the term, so it's okay if it's still a little bit odd. So that's all I got on vectors. We're going to move on to matrices. And as you can see, there's technically like 30 slides left, but the rest of it's a little bit faster. So I'm going to keep chugging along because I only got 40 minutes left. Um, yeah, so we'll keep going. Try and go on fewer tangents, trying to go on the phone with my uh, plumber. <clears throat> okay. So matrices are actually a lot like vectors, probably more similar than they look like until you've gotten to spend a lot of time with them. Matrices extend the idea of vectors to two dimensions. They have rows and they have columns. We can construct them directly using the function matrix in R. So I can say, create a matrix out of the first six letters of the alphabet, a matrix with two rows and three columns. If I do that, I get something that looks like this. I get the first six letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, and F, split into two rows and three columns. This is a matrix, it's got two dimensions. In fact, it's even being real polite and telling you how to subset individual dimensions of it. You'll notice these are the rows, these are the columns. If you wanted to subset F, you would do bracket two, three, and that would give you F. It's two dimensional subsetting. We'll show you here in the next slide, okay? If you wanna make a matrix, but you want the order to not be column wise, that is it fills in A, B, C, D, E, F, instead row wise, you can say by row equals true, and then it goes A, B, C, D, E, F when constructing the matrix. You can do it either way. Okay. So another way you can make matrices instead of just sort of creating them raw is by binding together individual vectors. I can say, I want to take the vectors 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, and bind them together as columns in a matrix. C bind is column bind, which says take each one of these vectors and make each one of them a column in a new matrix. So 1, 2 is the first column, 3, 4 is the second column, 5, 6 is the third column. C bind creates matrices by binding vectors together column wise. The row version of it is R bind for row bind. If I say take the vector one, two, three and the vector four, five, six, R bind will make it so the first row is one, two, three and the second row is four, five, six. You can manually construct matrices this way. R bind and C bind can also be used to generate data frames and bind matrices into bigger matrices and data frames into bigger data frames. So subsetting them, like I said, I thought it was the next slide, but it was actually two slides later. Um, we can subset matrices using the same methods as vectors. The difference is they have two dimensions instead of one. So you got to give them two positions in your brackets. So if I want to get, say, the first row and second column of A matrix, I would say A matrix subset to the first row and the second column. This would give me C because of the C in that matrix. If we go back, C is the first row and the second column. 
So I subset it as one comma two, rows first, columns second. Just like with vectors, we don't necessarily have to give it a single number, we can give it multiple numbers. I can say subset a matrix to its first row, but give me both columns two and three. You notice I have to put it in C to make sure that it's a vector, but it still sits after just the one comma right here. I don't want to do one comma two comma three, because then it thinks I want to subset three different dimensions, which is an array, not a matrix. I just want two. Okay, this gives me the first row, but the second and third columns. So I get a two element matrix out or two element vector. Okay, if you want to know how big a matrix is you're working with, matrices you use dimensions or dim to get their dimensions. If I say give me the dim of a matrix, it says two, three. It's not that it's 23, it's that it has two rows and three columns. There's two dimensions, so you got to ask for dim. Unintuitively, if you ask for the length of this matrix, it's going to give you the number six. It doesn't have six rows, it doesn't have six columns, it has six elements. The length of a matrix is the number of elements in it, which is equal to the number of rows times the number of columns. That's probably not what you want with a matrix, but that's what it's going to give you. Normally, what you want to do is do dim of it and get the rows and the columns. So a thing to know about matrices, if you subset a matrix and it ends up having either just one row or one column, R by default will convert it into a vector. R looks at it as like, ah, you want something one dimensional, vectors have one dimension, it converts it from a matrix into a vector. So if I say a matrix, give me the first row, I don't get something that looks like a matrix, I just get A and B, it's converted it into a vector. You might not want that. If you want to subset a matrix to a single row or column, but keep it as a matrix, you got to add this argument drop equals false in the brackets. It will keep it as a matrix. Just an arcane thing to know about. An annoying thing is data frames do this too. If you subset a single column out of a data frame, it comes out as a vector, unless you're using a tibble. If you're using a tibble in tidyverse, it never turns things into a vector. This is one of the nice things about tibbles. Just a thing to know. Okay. So matrix types. Matrices like vectors can be numeric, integer, factor, character, or logical, but they must only be one of those things at a time. They are not like data frames. You cannot do multiple data types in a single matrix. If I create a bad matrix here, by binding together the number one and two and the sixth and first letters of the alphabet, I get one, two, F and A. You'll notice the one and the two are in quotes. Because there are letters, F and A, the entire matrix, no matter how few letters and how many numbers are in there, the whole thing ends up being a character matrix. Type of matrix tells me it's character data. The idea in R is, a vector or a matrix cannot simultaneously store character data and numeric data. So if you put both in there, it wants to avoid losing anything. So it converts the entire thing to the lowest common denominator. The lowest common denominator, if there's character data, is character data. Weirdly enough, if you combine numeric data and a factor, you get out numerics because it strips the labels off and gives you the factor levels. Just a thing to know about. Okay. So, Matrices can only have one data type. This is the first way you know data frames, despite looking like a matrix, are lying to you and are not a matrix because they can have different data types in each column. You'll notice, though, they also can have da different data types like across like each row, but not within a given column, right? A single column all has to be the same data type. Ah, the columns are vectors, but the whole thing is not a matrix. We'll get there. Dimension names. So the thing is with a matrix, like a vector, you can give it names, but they've got two dimensions. So matrices can have two vectors of names. They have row names and they have column names. 
If I take my bad matrix and assign it the rows, wedge and bigs, and the columns, pilot grade, mustache grade, I get a matrix that looks like this. I get column names, but I also get row names here. So matrices, while they can only encode a single type of data like character numeric, they can take metadata to describe what's in the columns and the rows if you want. And they can have them in both columns and rows, right? And once you have row names and column names in a matrix, you can subset that matrix by those names. So if I say, take this bad matrix, give me the row named bigs, it gives me this row, two and a, okay? So we can subset by names in a matrix the same way we subset by elements in a vector. The subsetting is pretty similar. The difference is we just have more dimensions to work with. As you can see here, if I leave blank a dimension, it just gives me everything in that dimension. I left the columns location blank, so it gave me all the columns. This is our syntax for it. You leave a location blank, it gives you everything. <clears throat> okay. So matrices of the same dimensions, if you do math with them, they do entry-wise math just like vectors. So if I have two matrices here, I've called them C matrix and D matrix. These matrices are just uh, 1, 3, 5, 2, 4, 6, and the other matrix is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If I say something like, take three times C matrix divided by D matrix, this element here, three, is, a, the, is equal to three times one divided by one equals three. This element is three times three is nine divided by two is 4.5. It does them element by element exactly like vector arithmetic. You could just imagine it's taking these two matrices and just stacking them on top of each other and doing the calculations right down the individual elements. So it's going to add the cell 1, 1 to cell 1, 1 of the other matrix and so on. Okay. So. If you want to do certain matrix operations, so if you have any kind of experience in linear algebra, something like that, you might want to know how to do different types of matrix operations. One of the most common matrix operations we do in statistics is transpositions. Transposing a matrix is swapping its rows and columns. So it's essentially, you can kind of think of it like flipping a matrix across its diagonal. So if I say, take C matrix, uh, which is the matrix right here, one, three, five, four, uh, two, four, six. If I say take C matrix, T is transpose it. So I'm saying transpose this matrix and assign it to E matrix. You know a function is really core in a programming language if it has a one letter call, right? This is a statistical programming language. Transpositions are used constantly. So the function is T, okay? What this transposition does is it flips the rows and the columns. So what were once columns are now the rows. So instead of being the first row 135, now the first column is 135. It's just taken it diagonally and flipped it. Okay. So for those of you with some math training of some kind, some linear algebra training, you might have been asking for a while in your head, how do I do actual matrix multiplication in R? Well, if you want to do matrix multiplication and not entry-wise multiplication, you use the operator percent asterisk percent. This is the matrix multiplication operator. If you have two commensurate matrices, that is their inner dimensions line up with each other, you can do it like D matrix multiply E matrix. The result here is going to be matrix multiplication of these two matrices the result of it is going to be the outer dimensions of these two matrices. Okay, so good thing to know about if you wanna do matrix multiplication. If you pick the advanced homework option for this week, which is totally optional, um, you'll do a bunch of matrix multiplication because you'll do linear regression by hand. Um, if you have linear, regr or, um, linear algebra training, you realize linear regression is one of the easiest mathematical operations imaginable. It's a trivial math. It's hideous to do it with normal algebra, um, but you'll be able to do it sort of just with a, a single line of code um, like this. Okay, so that's 
So good to know how to do that. Or not, you may never use it. Okay. Another thing you might want to do if you get into the nuts and bolts of doing the math, you might want to invert a square matrix of some kind. So R can invert matrices using the function solve. Okay. If I say take F matrix that I created before, solve that matrix, it will return this matrix here, which is the uh, inverse of the F matrix. What is this question? C bind C matrix, D matrix. Sorry, what did this do? That took the C matrix and the D matrix and bound them together into a single larger matrix where each matrix is a set of columns. Just a way to take two matrices and jam them together sideways to display at the same time. Okay, so if you got a little bit of linear algebra training, you will know that if you take the inverse of a matrix and multiply that original matrix by it, you should get an identity matrix. People know what an identity matrix should look like, and do they see something wrong with this? Anybody know? Well, an identity matrix in linear algebra usually has zeros on its off diagonals and ones on its diagonal values. This does not look like a zero at first glance. It is actually very close to zero. This is an important thing to know about if you do math with a computer. It turns out computers are bad at math because they can't do fractions. Okay? So if they try and do things like divide or multiply by things with lots of decimal places, they end up getting non-zero values that should actually be zero and other sort of values that are failure sort of of rounding. This is an issue called floating point imprecision. These are very close to zero when they should be completely zero. So um, don't ever in computer programming test to see if something after a mathematical operation equals zero. You shouldn't test, instead test to see if something is pretty close to zero because many mathematical operations are simply never going to result in precise values. Your computer has a limit to how precise a number it can produce in decimal places. It's surprisingly limited. There's not that many decimal places they can generally go to and still be precise in their calculations. You do stuff like this, matrix inversion and things like that, you're going to get imprecision. You have to sort of buffer around it to deal with it. It's just a thing to know about. Your computer is doing a lot of rounding all the time. Okay. So yeah, don't test for equalities of numbers most of the time. Test for being really close to values. Or use integers. If you're working with integers, the integers will be exact values. Another thing you might want to do is extract the diagonal of a matrix or make a diagonal matrix, say an identity matrix. If I say diagonal two, it produces a two by two identity matrix. If I get the diagonals of my earlier matrix I made, it gives me the diagonal elements of this. This is something really useful for, say, extracting diagonal elements of a variance covariance matrix to get the standard errors. Useful. So that's all I got on matrices. Let's burn through lists next and get out of here. Leave the most horrible thing for last. Though I will talk about data frames after this a little bit. Okay. So what are lists? Lists are something I've been slightly avoiding talking about until now because they are complex. Lists give you way too many options to work with. So vectors and matrices can only store one type of data in them. Lists are the opposite of this. Lists don't care what you put in them. They don't care about the type of objects you put in. They also don't care about if they're the same length or have any relationship to each other. You can create a list using the function list. I'm going to create my list, assign to it a list. Its first element, I'm going to name first thing, and I'm going to put the numbers one through five in there. Its second element, I'm going to name second thing, and I'm going to put in there a matrix of the numbers 8 through 11 with two rows. And in its third element, I'm going to put in, I'm going to call it third thing, and put in a linear regression of distance on speed using the cars data. The resulting object here has 1 through 5, a matrix, and the entire output of a linear regression, all happily coexisting in the same bizarre object. Lists are freedom. 
You can put anything you want in them, which is both a boon and a curse. Lists are very powerful because you can stuff anything you want in there, but they rapidly become very confusing. Okay. <clears throat> so if you want to access elements of a list, there's a couple different ways to do it. Typically, you're going to be using double brackets or a dollar sign. I'm going to explain single brackets and double brackets in a second, but let's first talk about double brackets. If I say, take my list, double bracket the first thing, if you remember the first thing is the name of its first element, I get out that first element, one, two, three, four, five. If we go back to the prior slide, first thing was one, two, three, four, five. Okay. If I say my list dollar sign first thing, I get one, two, three, four, five. Where have we seen this dollar sign before? Where? We've seen that, right? We've seen subsetting data frames using dollar signs. Ah, data frames lie to you. They are a list. The reason subsetting methods like these work on data frames is because they're actually lists. They're square lists. So we can subset a list by saying, this dollar sign the name of an element, we can also numerically subset them. Take my list, bracket bracket one gives me the first element of the list. In all cases, it's one, two, three, four, five. And so just to follow up on the thing in chat, what was the third thing? The third thing really was an entire linear regression model of distance on speed using this data set. It's the entire model, including its variance, covariance matrix, its data set, its parameter estimates, all that kind of stuff. It's all stored in this object. There's a lot of stuff in there, and I'm going to delve into it in a minute. If you're not familiar with linear regression, don't worry about it. Not the purpose of my class. <clears throat> okay. So a lot of different ways to subset lists. So why the two brackets instead of the one brackets? So the thing about single and double brackets if you subset a list using single brackets instead of double brackets, the thing you get back is another list. Double brackets get the actual element, the actual object in the list. Single brackets give you back a list containing the element or elements you asked for. So if I say my list single bracket one and I get structure on this object, it says it a, a list of length one that contains the first thing, that being the numbers one, two, three, four, five. If I instead say, give me the structure of my list, double brackets one, it's an integer vector of length five, one, two, three, four, five. This gives me back a list. This gives me back the actual thing I'm asking for inside the list. Okay, let me illustrate this. Uh, okay. To illustrate this, this was a great image tweeted by Hadley Wickham a couple years ago that I really liked. Let's say you've got a list that looks like this. Imagine lists are containers. This salt or pepper shaker here is a container. It is a list. It contains a whole bunch of elements. Each element is a pepper packet. If I say x single bracket one, it still gives me the container, but it subsets it down to a single element of that container. If I say x double bracket one, it discards the container and gives me just the pepper packet, just the element inside. The way lists work is they can be nested. If I say subset to the pepper packet, x bracket bracket one, and then subset to the single element inside the pepper packet, I just get the pepper and not the packet. Does this make sense? Double brackets say, discard the container, give me the contents. Single brackets say, keep the container and give me only specific contents in the container. Okay. I've never seen list, uh, list subsetting displayed more clearly than with this pepper shaker. Okay. The neat thing about this, which becomes obvious when you think about it this way, is if you subset with single brackets, you can get a container that contains multiple objects. I could say, give me pepper packet one, two, three, and four. But if I don't have that container, I cannot subset and get multiple pe pe uh, pepper packets as like a stack of them, because R doesn't know how to return individual elements of a list. So if you want to get multiple things out of a list, you need to use single brackets and get multiple elements. 
But if you want one element, you can use double brackets and discard the container. The thing about R is R with a single function call can only ever return one object. And so if you want multiple objects, you need that container there to store them all. Okay. This might take some mind bending and experimentation, but look at this image and think back to this whenever you're trying to figure out how to subset a list and hopefully it'll make it a little clearer. Okay. So like I just said, if you subset a list, it can be greater than length one, but if you do that, it has to use single brackets. So if I wanted to get the first two elements of my list, I could say, take my list, subset its first and second elements. If I do that, I will get a length two list back. If I get structure on it, you'll see it's a length two list containing the first thing and the second thing. So single brackets let me get multi-elements out of a list back instead of just one. Okay. So something to know about, the output from just about every statistical routine you'll ever use in R is a list. It's probably not going to spit out a data frame, a matrix, or something like that. It's going to give you a list. So if I say my list bracket bracket three, this is the output from that very simple linear regression model I ran before. Even that simple model is a massive list of many things. It is a list with 12 different elements to it containing things like the co fitted coefficients of the model, the residuals effects, the rank, the fitted values. Yeah, if you run a linear model, it actually already calculates the fitted values. It calculates a whole bunch of optimization parameters and things tons of stuff, okay? If you run a linear regression, it produces way more things than you probably need. You might want to extract specific things from this to do certain things. Maybe you want to manually calculate standard errors or something like that. To do that, you got to dig in here and grab something out of it, okay? But it's a list. If you know how to navigate lists, you can get what you want out of this massive hideous output. Okay, so if you want to know what is inside a big list of things, typically lists and their sub elements will have names. If I want to know all the things that are in a linear regression output, I can say, take my list and subset it to that linear regression model I had in there. Give me its names. Names extracts the names of an object and displays them as a vector. These are all the different elements inside a linear regression list object. It has the things that I showed before and a couple other things like the model, which is the data used to fit it and stuff. Okay. So data frames. I keep saying data frames are lying to you and they're actually lists and not matrices. Data frames are lists, but they are lists with one specific important constraint. They are lists in which every element of the list must have the same number of elements itself. So if I get structure on the cars data frame, which is built into R, it says it is a data frame of 50 observations of two variables. But you'll notice the rest of the structure output looks like the structure output from lists earlier. It says dollar sign speed, colon, numeric, blah, 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 dollar sign distance. Just like lists, you can subset down to individual elements of a data frame using dollar signs like a list. If this was a list containing the elements speed and distance, you could say this list dollar sign speed and get this thing out. The one difference between a list and a data frame is every one of the columns of a data frame is allowed to be a column by forcing them all to have the same length. Speed must be length 50, distance must be length 50. Everything else about data frames is identical to a list. It's just that they're constrained to all have the same number of elements, which is the number of rows in the data frame. So they're sort of a compromise between a matrix and a list, but they're mostly a list. <clears throat> Another thing about them, if you get the length of a data frame, you don't get the number of rows and you don't get the number of observations. The length of a data frame is the number of columns because it's actually a list and the length of a list is the number of elements in it. The length of a data frame is how many columns it has, that is how many elements that list has, okay? But if you look at the sub elements of it, if I say subset to cars, specifically the distance column, 
the length of each column will be same as the number of rows in the data frame. They're forced to be the same. Okay. So, ah, this is a great question. Do lists automatically become data frames if they have the same lengths of vectors? No, it would be very R-like to do that, but they do not. Okay. Okay. So, like I was saying, you can treat a data frame like a list, but you can also treat a data frame like a matrix. The power of constraining every one of those columns to be the same length is that it gains you the ability to subset them like a matrix too. So if I say, take the car's data frame subset to row one, all columns, I get the first row of the data frame. You can't do this in lists because there's no way to have rows and columns in a list. They don't have them. They just have a length. But because they have the same number of elements in every one or the same number of elements in every one of the columns, they effectively have rows and can pretend they're a matrix. So you can say, subset the car's data frame to its first five rows and its speed column. And I get the first five rows and the speed column. Data frames let you pretend they're a matrix even though they're a list. This is kind of the reason they exist, is to allow us to use all of our matrix tools without constraining us to be only one data type at a time. This is a really nice, powerful thing. Okay. So after showing you a bunch of base R things and base R nitty gritty stuff so far in this uh, lecture, um, think about which way you like more to deal with things in R. So let's see this calculation in base R. What I'm doing here is I'm going to calculate the mean of elements in the Swiss data set, specifically those where the value of education is above the mean of education and then subset to the education column. Give me the average of that, those numbers. <clears throat> That's confusing. In dplyr, it would be this. Take the Swiss data set and then filter it so that I look only at values where education is greater than the average of education, and then calculate the average of this as the mean of the resulting values of education. The thing about base R is this is clean, powerful, and fast, but it's very difficult to read. This bulkier, in some ways, syntax lets you read things in a logical fashion. I begin with a data set. I put some constraints on it. I filter the specific values, and then I do some calculation with it. Okay. I teach dplyr and dplyr approaches to things because I find people can tend to understand and piece together these sorts of calculations faster, easier, and more intuitively than the base R methods. But over time, you will become familiar with writing things this way too. And sometimes there's reasons to do it this way. It's just kind of intimidating and weird at first. But these things are equally valid ways of approaching the same problem. So a uh, little aside here, I mentioned tibbles a couple times. Type inverse functions, like a lot of stuff in dplyr, use a special type of data frame called a tibble. You can construct tibbles instead of data frames using the tibble function instead of the data frame function. You can also convert existing data frames into a tibble using as underscore tibble. Tibbles work basically like a data frame. The main advantage they have is they display differently if you display them in your console. Okay? So if I say, take the Swiss data set, select its second and third columns, and give me the first six rows, it will display like this. If I do the same thing, I could say, take the Swiss data set, select the second and three rows, convert it to a tibble, I make its row names equal to name for a reason I'll talk about in a second, and I display it. The output for this says it is a tibble with six rows and three columns. Its columns are name, agriculture examination, and it shows its data types. It shows a little bit more information than a default data frame, but there's one really important thing to know about tibbles. Tibbles do not have row names. Base R data frames have row names like this. These are the names of the provinces in the Swiss data set. If on that first homework you wanted to get them, you probably were very confused about how to get those row names because they're not a column in the data set. The designers of the tidyverse think that this is bad. Row names are stupid. Row names are a property of observations. They are in fact data and should be in their own column. The tidyverse has abolished row names. 
So if you want to take a data set, convert it to a tibble and keep its row names, you have to say, convert the row names to a column named something, and now name as a column. Row names don't make any sense. Column names do, okay? So in tidy data, just know you got to do this. I generally like tibbles, but I fluidly move between them in data frames. In general, though, I highly recommend never using row names unless you're doing some real nitty gritty statistical programming where your rows and your columns are interchangeable. But in that case, you probably are working with a matrix. Okay. This thing I say up here, tibbles do not convert strings to factors is no longer relevant. As of our version 4.0, basic data frames don't convert your strings to factors. In the dark age of R, prior to R version 4, if you loaded character data into a data frame, it automatically converted into a factor, which was stupid. They abolished that, so it's not a problem anymore. Okay. One quick little aside here for people's statistics training. If you do not have any statistical training, you've never taken like a method sequence in your classes or something like that, feel free to plug your ears and sing the Meow Mix song or something. You do not need to know about this, but you do you. So maybe you want something like you have a linear regression object and you want to pull out things like fitted values, maybe standard errors. So if you remember, my list element three was a linear regression output. I can say, take my list three and then subset down to its coefficients element. And it gives me a named vector of the intercept and the coefficient on the speed variable. Notice what I'm doing here. In R, you can chain together an arbitrarily long uh, series of subsetting operations, and it executes them left to right. It takes my list, subsets it to its third element, and then subsets the result of that to the element named coefficients. Okay, So I might do something like subset my list to its linear regression, grab the coefficients matrix, and then subset it to the column speed. Not really the column. In this case, it's the element speed in a named vector. This gives me 3.9, which is the named element speed in a vector. OK, this is hideous. You probably won't do this. But just know you can do as many subsetting operations as you want sequentially. Yeah. In some ways, this is kind of like chaining together functions in Python if you're from uh, Python world. Okay, so maybe what we actually want out of our linear regression is the standard errors. Turns out the standard errors don't exist in linear regression output. You got to calculate them afterwards. One way to calculate them is to get a summary of a linear regression. I can say, take that linear regression object, calculate a summary of it. By default, this is just going to print a bunch of nice output. It produces an output table, looks like something you get from like Stata. It shows the parameter estimates, that's the coefficients, but also shows their standard errors, t values, uh, p values, and a bunch of other things like the r squared, adjusted r squared, f stat, all that kind of jazz, p value for the whole model, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is a nice summary output. The thing is, is this looks like something that's designed just for you to look at, but it is in fact another list object we can extract things from if we really want to. Maybe what I want are these standard errors right here. Let's yank them out of this object. Okay, I can say here, take a summary of my linear regression. So this produces the summary. And then bracket bracket subset to its coefficients object, which unlike the original linear regression is now a big matrix of things. This thing contains its estimates, standard error, t value and p value. On the prior slide, you'll see this thing named coefficients in the output, if I ask for dollar sign coefficients on a summary object, it'll spit this table out, which is what I've just done right here. Subset out, give me the coefficients. If, say, I want the standard error on the speed coefficient, I can use this hideous mess. Give me the summary of my linear regression, subset down to its coefficients matrix, Give me the speed row and the standard error column. So this narrows all the way down to the speed row, the standard error column, and it spits out 0.4155128. So what this mess here is meant to be is not an example of something you want to do, but an example that nothing is off limits to you in R. 
if you see something that is produced by an R function, you can find a way to get it. Okay, you can rip that thing out and you can make it in your R markdown document, make it dynamically source something like that. It's all there, it's all accessible. Okay. So we might want to do something with that, say in an R markdown document. Maybe we've got an R markdown document where every time we knit the document, it generates different data. So we're always going to have different like parameter estimates and confidence intervals on some model. Well, why not make it so it dynamically updates those things? To do that, we got to get these standard errors and these coefficient estimates. So what I'm going to do on this prior slide here, I created uh, speed beta. So I extracted this beta coefficient, this estimate from the model. On this slide here, I extracted its standard error. Let's use these objects to calculate a confidence interval. I say here, the confidence interval on speed is equal to the parameter speed beta plus the 0.975 quantile of a normal distribution, negative and positive times the standard error of that parameter estimate. I'm going to add names to this confidence interval of lower and upper. So the 0.975 quantile of a normal distribution is the number 1.96. So if you remember from your stats classes, plus minus 1.96 is whether something's statistically significant or not in bad research. That's exactly what you get. Okay. So now you can include these values in a markdown document. I could say this text. A one mile per hour increase in speed is associated with a backtick R round speed beta to one digit foot increase in stopping distance with a 95% confidence interval of round my lower confidence interval to one, my upper confidence interval to one. The actual text that would appear in my document is a one mile per hour increase in speed is associated with a 3.9 foot increase in stopping distance with a 95% CI of 3.1 to 4.7. If you got linear regression models in your papers or something like that, you could use this primitive method for extracting them and filling in coefficients. Steal my code to do it, adapt it to your uses. <clears throat> okay, so your homework. First thing I want to say is you don't have to do this. This is an optional practice, but you're now at a stage in this class where you should be comfortable with the first few automated tutorials in the swirl package. The swirl package for R is an in console automated system for doing R tutorials, usually with base R functions. If you install the swirl package, say library swirl and then type swirl in your console it will bring up a menu and you can select our programming pick tutorials and follow directions if you want to do a little bit of extra practice in addition to what we're doing in lab and stuff do this maybe consider the first one to eight of the fast tutorials in there basic r introduction there's also um our studio ones built in with the learner package which i've never used but i could look up how to do them so Okay, what's this? So anyway, uh, your homework, you have two choices for homework this week. Uh, this is, I think the only time I offer two homework choices. Um, your options are a simpler one, which is a data structure practice. You have a template posted on the website. It is an R markdown file to walk you through creating, accessing, and manipulating our data structures. In this one, you will enter values in the R markdown template. Every time you enter an answer, knit the document. What this will do is it will tell you if you got the right answer or not. If you did not get the right answer, it will tell you what it thinks you did not do right, give you some suggestions, okay? So if you get an error and it fails to knit completely, undo that and see if there was a mistake you made. I wrote this assignment and it can generally handle most things y'all will break on it, but I can't predict everything that can be done, so it's not perfect. This is sort of a self-grading little assignment to guide you through. The important thing is don't answer multiple questions and then knit it. Instead, knit it after each answer, check to make sure it's correct, and then move on. Your more advanced option is to do linear regression from scratch and compare it to the base LM function in R. You'll manually do all the matrix math and everything with simulated data. You'll check it out, okay? Um, this one, it doesn't check your answers as you go. Um, either way, these are relatively long. They're not super hard, but they're relatively long. When we go to lab, we will only walk through the data structure practice one directly in lab, okay? But we'll do the entire thing in lab. 
every homework in this class from now on out, we will do the entire homework in lab from scratch. Okay. So uh, I'll see folks on Monday. It's all we got. If you got questions, hit me up. Sorry for going three minutes over.